Good afternoon to our participants in, uh, in the US. Good, um, a very good evening to our audience in Germany and via Zoom and uh, YouTube beyond Germany in other countries worldwide. My name is Paul Linnertz. Uh, a very warm welcome from my home office here in Washington, DC. I'm the director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, or in English, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation office in the US. Today, we would like to talk about the rise of the millennial and minority vote in the US. During the next 60 minutes, we will focus on how the young vote and diversity vote may impact the upcoming 2020 elections. And we will learn more about young and minority voter demographics, um, uh, political attitudes and voting behavior. For us, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, a German foundation with civic education centers all around Germany, but also offices in more than 100 countries worldwide. This topic is highly relevant, not only because we are dealing with transatlantic relations and our close partnership to the US, with the US anyway, anyway in various aspects. Apart from that, it is incredibly important for us because millennials and Gen Z constitute the next generation of leadership and will drive the future course of the United States, of course. In Germany and Europe, this share or part of the electorate might still be smaller than in the US, but we are also experiencing demographic change and more diversity in our societies. For us, it's therefore quite important to have a look at what is going on here in the United States. In order to do so, I'm very happy to welcome an incredible lineup of panelists today. They will first deliver some opening remarks followed by Q&A with our participants. To our participants on Zoom, please enter your questions in the chat room. With us today are Leila Zaidan, Executive Director and COO of the Millennial Action Project, Eleanor O'Neill, Research Director at Echelon Insights, and last but not least, William H. Frey, Senior Fellow of the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Let's not start um, with ladies first today, but with Bill, because you've prepared a short PowerPoint presentation for us to pave the ground, let's say. Before you are going to start, please let me allow a few words to introduce you to our audience. William Frey is an internationally regarded demographer known for his research on urban populations migration, immigration, race, aging, and political demographics. William has authored over 200 publications and several books. Two years ago, you've published a book called Diversity Explosion, How New Racial Demographics Are Remaking America. Will received a PhD on, in sociology from Brown University. Thank you so much for joining us, Bill. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I really uh, appreciate the invitation to be with this group. And I'd like to start with my PowerPoint. Uh, I'm a demographer, so I'm gonna talk about demographics. Let me move into this. Oops. Yes. Uh, uh, I think that it's important to talk about how demographic change, especially uh, racial demographic change is occurring in the United States, especially is running up to this election and especially focusing on the younger generations, uh, millennials and generation Z in particular. Uh, in my book, Diversity Explosion, I try to make the case that America is at a pivotal point in demography and in terms of how we're going to treat uh, our culture and society. The last part of the 20th century was dominated native to a large part about by baby boomers, people like me, uh, largely white and now pretty old. Uh, but now as we move into the 21st century, we're becoming more racially diverse. And it's the younger generations that are ushering that in and are going to change our society in important ways. I wanna talk about a few things. I'm gonna talk about the diversity demographics through the 2016 election, the one where Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. I'm then gonna talk a little bit about the midterms, the 2018 election. This is a, between the two presidential elections. It's the most recent one. Uh, and then I'm gonna say a little bit more about youthful diversity in the United States to kick off our rest of our discussion. Uh, if you look at this chart, you'll see that the um, 
growth of different racial and ethnic groups projected between 2015 and 2060 is quite different. Uh, the last three bars show that Hispanics and Asian Americans and people of two or more race are projected to grow quite dramatically, uh, doubling or tripling in size over the next uh, 40 or 45 years. The black population will grow about 37%. American Indians and Alaska Natives will grow about 14%. But whites will show a projected decline. Why is that? Well, whites are older, more than die. Uh, they have fewer births. And from among many younger whites, uh, they get involved in interracial marriages, marrying people from other backgrounds. And the children of those, those marriages wind up in the two or more race category. So this white population, which is still a big part of the United States, is shrinking. The most important part of this change, though, is that this is occurring among the younger age groups. Here's a chart which shows uh, from left to right the youngest age group up to the oldest age group. And progressively, as you get younger, the more racially diverse you get especially if you look at the population under age 40. All of those people under age 40 are millennials and Generation Zers and people younger than Generation Zers. We don't have a name for them yet, but they're there. And you can see just how racially diverse they are compared to say the baby boomers who are now between the ages of 56 and 74 uh, still remains much whiter. Now, when you look at social and political discourse in the United States today, you see there's a little bit of what I would call a cultural generation gap. That is the older population, uh, largely white. Some of them have not looked very kindly uh, or accepting this younger diversity. And uh, we see this sort of be part of politics. Uh, a lot of the people who want, want to stop immigration to the United States, that's popular with some of these older folks uh, because they, uh, they don't see this diversity as a good thing. And of course, as a demographer, I can tell them that immigration will not change one way or the other. We're going to come more, we're going to come more racially diverse anyway. Uh, and among the younger generation, they're much more open to interracial marriages. And now in the last several months, much more involved in things like uh, fixing the criminal justice system in the United States and ending systemic racism in the United States. So this cultural generation gap is something that's going to be around for a little bit and may affect our politics. But uh, so we're getting more diverse from the younger ages to the older ages. We're also becoming more racially diverse from the melting pot parts of the country, big coastal racially diverse places, more toward the inner part of the country. And this map shows this, what's shown in this map uh, for all the counties is which non-white group has an, a high representation in many of these counties. In the South, you can see those red counties, that's the black population have an overrepresentation. Uh, and in the, in the Southwest and in other parts of the country, you see it for Asians, uh, Asian Americans and Hispanics, uh, some from American Indians and Alaska Natives. And there's a lot of white in the middle of the United States. And you might say, well, you know, the United States is pretty white anyway, but a lot of those counties, although they look good on a map, are, are pretty small in size and shrinking in population. They only make up about 30% of the US population, these largely white counties. So we're becoming more racially diverse uh, in lots of ways. Let's think about how this affects elections. Now, if we looked at the presidential elections between 2004 and 2016, that's four of them. One elected George Bush, a Republican, two elected Barack Obama, a Democrat, and then the most recent one electing Donald Trump, uh, a Republican. What you see here is the uh, what we call the Democratic minus Republican voter margin. So it's a percent voting Democrat minus percent voting Republican. The positive bars show people who voted strongly Democratic. The negative show people who voted strongly Republican. And what you can see for different racial groups among whites, whites voted Republican in each of those four presidential elections. And in fact, you can go back to the year 1968 is when whites started voting Republican in presidential elections ever since. Uh, for the racial minority populations, blacks in particular voted, voted very strongly Democratic, especially those two years, 2008 and 2012, when Barack Obama, the first black president, uh, was running for office. And what helped him along was the turnout 
and the strong support of young people, young blacks in the United States. They had a lot to do with electing Barack Obama, as well as younger people who are Hispanics and younger people who are Asians in voting the Democratic in office in those two elections. Of course, the Republican Donald Trump won in 2016 because of the Electoral College in the United States, meaning that different states voted in different ways. But if you just looked at the total vote, which is called the popular vote, actually Hillary, Hillary Clinton had more votes than Donald Trump. Now, this next chart is very important for our discussion today because it shows voting patterns for different age groups. And this is for the presidential election of 2016. The four age groups we're looking at are people age 18 to 29, 30 to 44, 45 to 64, and 65 and over. And if you shift your attention to the right part of this chart, those four bars for the total population show that in 2016, the two younger age groups voted Democrat for Hillary Clinton. The two older age groups voted Republican for Donald Trump. On the other hand, if you look at the middle, which is all the racial minorities, all the non-white minorities in the United States, people of color, as we say, uh, aggregated together, all of the age groups voted Democratic in 2016 for Trump, but especially those younger age groups, uh, the under age 45 age groups. And even if you go to the left, which looks at the white pattern for those age groups, although they all voted Republican in 2016 for Donald Trump, the very youngest age groups were least likely to vote Republican of all of them. So we can see going forward, uh, there's kind of a generational thing going on here. When I talked before about the cultural generation gap, that plays into this a little bit when you look at these data. I think if you look ahead to the 2018 midterms, now this is two years after the presidential election, and here in the United States, we vote for the Congress, uh, people representing each uh, election, all parts of the country in, in our Congress, you'll see that uh, there is even stronger Democrat support among younger people in what we call the House of Representatives, the House elections in 2018 on the right-hand side, than there was in the presidential election in 2016. Now, Donald Trump did not stand for office in 2018, but a lot of people think that when there was a vote for their local con con congressperson, uh, that was kind of a, a way of indicating how they feel about Donald Trump and the Republican Party. And you can see these younger folks the 18 to 29 year olds and the 30, 44 year olds, even more strongly democratic than in uh, the 2016 election would suggest which might be coming along in our presidential election in November. Even more so, uh, these young people turned out to vote. Now a turnout rate is something that said of all the people who are eligible to vote, of all the citizens in the United States, how many of them actually voted uh, now, typically young people don't turn out as much as older people, but here for these 18 to 29 year olds, there was a huge increase in turnout in the 2018 House election compared with the 2014 House election, uh, almost double for some of these groups, which says again that there's a lot of excitement and a lot of energy in, uh, in politics and particularly in what's going on today in America among these younger folks. This was even before the COVID pandemic and even before the Black Lives Matter movement and even before all these demonstrations that young people are involved in. Even then, in 2018, they were strongly excited about voting and as we saw earlier, voted for Democratic folks. So here's a point, here we're gonna to move to the 2020 electorate uh, to begin our discussion of what's going to happen uh, in November. And if you look at the eligible voters, these are people age 18 and over who are citizens. These are people who are eligible to vote. For the very first time, we see that millennials and Gen Z eligible voters make up about 37% of all eligible voters. That's about the same as baby boomers and people older than baby boomers, I say pre-baby boomers there. So they're gonna have a huge clout. What's gonna matter is how well they turn out for this election, but we had a good signal from 2018 that they're gonna turn out pretty well. As I indicated before, these young people are much more racially diverse. 55% of them uh, are white of Generation Z, about 60% of them are white of the millennial generation compared to like 75% white and 80% white of the pre-boomers. So again, we have huge diversity among these young people in big numbers. Uh, another way to look at their impact can be if you look at this map, which shows for eligible voters only under age 40, 
Uh, so these are all the millennials and all the Gen Zers who are eligible to vote. What percentage of them are to identify with a racial group other than white? And there are nine states, those dark green states there, many of them in the West, many of them in the Southeast, uh, more than half of the eligible voters under age 40 are people of color. And I think this is gonna be very important in the election for some swing states or near swing states that are likely to decide the election like Arizona or Florida or Georgia or even Texas. In fact, if you look at a couple of these states in particular, here this chart shows that um, the uh, uh, for states of Arizona, Georgia, and Texas compares the racial composition of all ages of eligible voters with those who are under age 40. And in Arizona, for example, you see about 44% of these younger eligible voters are Latino or Hispanic uh, compared to a smaller number of the older group. And the same for these other states. So you're having a very large number of young people uh, who have a lot of issues to deal with, uh, who become very energized as a result of the last few months here in the United States. And we're gonna see what they do in terms of the election in uh, November. And I think that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this panel. So I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this and uh, look forward to our discussion. Thank you, dear Bill. That was indeed um, very helpful as a first presentation to pave the ground. Um, let's um, move on now to Eleanor uh, O'Neill. Uh, just as a uh, brief introduction before joining Echelon, Eleanor was the program manager for public opinion research and senior research associate at the American Enterprise Institute. At uh, AEI, she helped develop and coordinate survey research projects, including AEI's American Perspective Survey. She co-authored numerous articles and reports. And uh, Eleanor, you grew up in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas, with Texas, which was mentioned already in um, Bill's presentation a few times, and graduated with a BA in political science from Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. Eleanor, thank you so much for your time today. Perhaps from your side, a few more words on young voters political views and issues they care about? Yes, I'm happy to get started here. So I, I must say, I'm, I'm very delighted to be here. Um, and as I was trying to think about um, what I could maybe bring to the panel, knowing the company that I would have here um, and, and their expertise, I tried to think about uh, what are the things that I look at when I'm looking at polls. So. Uh, when I start to look at surveys, in particular with voters, I tend to think about what is new and what is not. Um, that's usually the easiest way for me to uh, sort the data. Um, and uh, kind of coming from the wonderful intro we've had and sort of the history and development of demography here, um, I think that was a good kind of stage for what is changing um, and kind of what, what we do know at this point. Um, so, so thinking specifically about millennials or young voters, um, of which I am one, <laughs> I am kind of in the middle of that um, at 29. So um, we, when we talk about millennials, um, we're specifically talking about people born between 1981 and 1996. Um, I tend to go with the Pew Research Center definition um, on that, that, that they have been using um, for a few years now. Um, but also, I think whenever we are talking about any election, it does tend to just be easier to talk about young voters. So I'll go back and forth a little bit here um, in the next few minutes. Um, but okay, sorry. Um, so um, since millennials entered adulthood, and this became a little easier to examine in the context of public opinion polls, um, it's been clear that there are some generational differences on certain issues um, that transcend party, which to me is interesting um, in thinking about kind of those unexpected things that, that at this point we, we know pretty well are true of millennials. Um, three issues that have kind of stood out to me as I have um, studied public opinion are um, their support for same-sex marriage, which is something we see in coming into this, 
um, their views on climate change um, and their belief that it is caused by human activity um, and being more supportive of green energy um, and their awareness of uh, racial issues and being more likely to kind of see the uh, issues that exist, um, for example, in believing that Black Americans are more likely to face challenges than white Americans. These are things that I feel are you know, relevant to the election, but that are fairly well known at this point. Um, they're not really new to me. Um, so I think that's kind of, you know, the, we have this context here where we have this generation that um, is more liberal, including among those who would be sort of in the uh, Republican camp. Um, so I think with that um, coming in, you would expect these groups to be, continue to be strong um, democratic supporters. Um, and then we enter 2020, where obviously what is new is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and its disproportionate effects upon people of this generation and young voters. Um, I you know a recent Pew survey showed 52% of people under age 30 are living with their parents. Um, they have been disproportionately affected by job loss um, when you're looking at younger Americans. Um, so beyond the effects that everyone has been feeling, this is really um, kind of an issue that impacts them. So what I wanted to talk about there um, with that specifically is kind of what, how, how do those things factor into um, their views on like the presidential race. So um, the easiest way for me to do that and kind of looking at different polls was to pull from Echelon's data. Um, we have a monthly survey of likely voters um, that we do that's attached to a voter file. Um, so I wanted to just pull from our August uh, survey where we showed millennial voters um, going for Biden by a 30, like 35 point margin, um, which is large. And I think it's probably a little larger than you're seeing in some other polls at this point. Um, but I did want to just provide that for context before I um, mentioned some of the others. So um, th when we asked about most important issues facing the country, um, like other generations, millennials, um, top issue was jobs in the economy, followed by healthcare, which is not surprising given the current context. Um, when we asked about their approval of Trump um, on those issues, in the economy tends to be slightly higher at 34% approval um, than his handling of the pandemic at 24% approval. Um, and when we ask you know, which candidate they would trust to handle the economic recovery and the public health response, Biden wins strongly on both of those, slightly higher on the public health response than economic recovery, but on both of those, really far ahead, um, which is notable um, because the economy is typically a strong issue for Republicans. But on that, we saw like, a, a smaller margin where um, when uh, on handling the economic recovery, they still chose Biden 61% to 29%. So um, I think that is something uh, where we have seen a shift and perhaps you're seeing the pain of the uh, like current scenario. Um, that being said, given their concern about the economy, they are still very concerned. They are more concerned about reopening too quickly. So I think both of those elements, both the concern about public health and healthcare and the economy um, are kind of t top issues to consider, um, which I, is probably not surprising, but is certainly new this year um, and kind of in a, in a new way. Um, I think the other thing that I've been looking at and seeing in the polls and specifically related to millennials um, is enthusiasm. So, you know, coming into this election, we know these, uh, this is a um, kind of strong group uh, for Biden. They supported Clinton by um, 19 points in 2016. Um, but earlier in the spring, um, there, and well, in a little bit, until recent months, there was this odd thing where suddenly this big generational gap that we've seen in uh, political support shifted where the kind of voters in the oldest category were a little more toward Biden than you would expect. Um, and millennials looked a little less enthusiastic um, about Biden. Now, I think that's started to revert. Um, Biden is kind of at the same level in recent polls um, as Clinton was in 2016. So that is no longer the case. 
Um, but, uh, and, and, and that's not just in our poll, which does tend to be a little bit higher, but um, in other polls as well. Um, so I think then what really remains is not so much their uh, political positions, but just kind of how, how enthusiastic will they be um, is sort of the remaining question. Um, while I am not the one to do demographics and turnout, and I'm not going to uh, venture a guess at that, particularly this year, um, we given the current context and a lot of uncertainties um, around voting. Um, I think I did want to at least bring one one poll finding um, that I thought might be um, might be of interest. Um, so in this cycle, enthusiasm overall has been higher um, for all groups. Um, a lot higher than in previous elections. Um, so in a CNN poll released at the beginning of September, 51% of registered voters under 35, so they were extremely or very enthusiastic about voting for president compared to 82% of registered voters ages 65 and older. Um, for comparison, in late September, early October 2016, 30% of 18 to 34 year olds and 56% of those ages 65 and older said they were highly enthusiastic about voting. Um, so the takeaway is that enthusiasm is higher among both groups um, and the gap between them is really not substantially different. So I think some of the concerns that people had earlier about enthusiasm of millennials for supporting Biden, um, or even here that this would just be one indicator that um, there's not, there has not been a, a decrease in their level of enthusiasm about participating in the election compared to older groups. Um, it's still maybe about where it was at this point in 2016, um, just at least with that, that one indicator. Um, another per survey that um, recently in a recent Fox News poll that asked about motivations for vote choice, 53% of likely voters ages 18 to 29 um, said fear the other candidate might win, while 45% said enthusiasm for their candidate was a bigger motivation. Um, and that survey had Biden with a 31 point lead among likely voters in that age group. So I think even beyond the question of enthusiasm um, is the question of like whether that really matters when there are clearly some other things driving um, their, their vote this year um, as well. So those are sort of my uh, quick takes. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it on to someone who um, spends a lot more time uh, working on millennial in issues specific to millennials. Um, and I didn't wanna, I tried to avoid stealing things that I thought she might uh, talk about. So I'll pass it on to you, Layla. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, I'll um, uh, thank you for also mentioning or raising the issue of the topics of topic priorities of young voters. I I probably get back to you um, later on with a question. Before yet, um, I'd like to invite Leila indeed to share her thoughts. Before Leila joined the Millennial Action Project in 2016. She served as managing director for Generation Progress, where she led various projects around solutions to the challenges facing today's youth. Leila is a recognized expert on youth engagement and has been featured in outlets, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, Forbes, US News and World Report, Huffington Post and McClatchy and many others. Leila graduated from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service with a degree in international politics. Leila, I'm happy to have you here with us today. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. And these are you know, two tough acts to follow, but I will do my best. Um, I had a feeling that we might hear some really great data and, and numbers behind what's going on and the trends that we're seeing. And so um, I hope I can put a little bit of color um, and, and share some of what I'm seeing in my conversations with, with young people um, and with our young leaders that, that we're working with through Millennial Action Project. Um, and just you know, very quickly, MAP, we're a nonprofit organization that, that's working to activate young elected officials to bridge the partisan divide and, and transform American politics. And we focused in on this generation for a reason. You know, there's a lot that's interesting about this generation. And, and in fact, we're actually seeing similar patterns uh, that we have noticed in the millennial generation with the even younger generation of, of Gen Z as well. 
Um, but something that my co-panelists have, have mentioned and, and that I like to point out as well is just the diversity of this cohort in every sense of the word. As you know, as we talk about millennials, I think it's very important to remember that they are not a monolithic group. In, or, in addition to um, some of the more obvious demographic diversity, I see an incredible diversity in their politics as well. And, and what I mean by that is, is that young people are able to hold a spectrum of viewpoints and that they can hold any different permutation or combination of priority issues. And so, for example, you know, a young person could care just as much about a traditionally, you know, Republican issue, like say the national debt, um, as they might care about something, you know, Eleanor mentioned something like climate change. And that, you know, them being able to hold multiple truths at once, make it so that they don't fit neatly into the partisan boxes that, that we've drawn. Um, and indeed, you know, the fastest growing political affiliation in the US is, is independent. And so what that means at the ballot box is it is not enough to just have a, a D or an R after your name to convince a millennial to vote for you. And, you know, I think, um, Bill, you mentioned this as well, kind of in 2020, I think this cohort is more fired up than ever to participate in the election. So they're they're out in the streets protesting, they're talking to their friends, they're answering um, surveys saying that they intend to, to participate and if the trends that we saw in 2018 hold, we'll see record turnout this year. Um, but this, this cohort is more focused on a candidate that speaks to them on the policies and the issues that they care about. Um, and, and that, you know, knowing that those issues are, are truly and authentically a priority for that candidate, they are less likely to vote straight party ticket. And that has implications at both, um, you know, the top of the ticket, but also races down ballot at the more local level in Congress or state legislatures or even more local than that. Um, you know, and, and so kind of one takeaway that I would like to, you know, make sure our viewers walk away with is that among this generation, they are not voting for a party, they are voting for a person and translating the enthusiasm and the preferences of this generation um, are very closely linked to the candidate and not the political party for which that candidate is, is representing. Um, which, you know, I think represents a huge opportunity for can candidates this season um, to actually talk to young voters, talk to minority voters, um, and connect on, on what matters most to them. I think the energy, the passion, uh, you know, I think the, the enthusiasm and, and the turnout are there. Now it's up to candidates to actually connect the dots on the substance if they wanna translate that energy into a winning 2020 strategy. Um, and then, you know, just one last thing that I'll mention before um, turning it back to, to kind of a, a conversation is um, I, I do want to make sure to point out that the energy that we're seeing among this, this cohort is not just among voters. This year, we are seeing a record number of young and minority candidates running for office as well, um, up and down the ticket, you know, from the most local positions all the way up to Congress. and. Um, I think that is that is notable and that translates into turnout and enthusiasm among voters seeing people who who reflect them on the ticket or who represent kind of um, their preferences, their priorities and their values. Millennial Action Project has been uh, tracking millennial candidates for Congress cycle over cycle. And, and this year alone, Louisiana still has to do their primary, but of all the other primaries for Congress, um, we have seen a 266% increase in millennial candidates since last cycle, 266% increase. And many of them are, are people of color. And, and this is gonna spark turnout. So, you know, I would in, encourage us to, you know, in addition to seeing this block as voters um, and paying attention to that, to also think about the swell of young people that we're seeing as candidates, um, you know, the, the minorities we're seeing as candidates and who are changing, not just who's on the ballot, but ultimately what gets done in the legislature. 
So, you know, maybe I'll, I'll pause there and, and turn it back over to you, Paul, for um, any additional questions, but just wanted to make that last point about young people kind of holding the levers of power inside the legislature as well. Leila, thank you so much. Um, um, we've learned a lot already, and we've already touched upon a variety of aspects. Um, uh, one before, I know we already have some uh, questions from the audience, but just one final question from my side. And we touched upon the topic priorities already um, compared to, let's say, all registered voters. Young voters appear to have different topic priorities. The millennials and the Gen Z, the, the post-Cold War generations rank issues like climate change higher um, let's say, than the average registered voter, yet seem to be that at least every once in a while part of some, some analysis or report, seem to be less interested in foreign policy. Do you agree or would you, would you have a different viewpoint on that? Perhaps we start with uh, Eleanor because you mentioned the issue of topics already before. Sure. So I think uh, particularly on foreign policy, I think it depends on what uh, what aspect of foreign policy you are uh, referring to there. I think um, what we have seen with millennials um, as they have um, been in adulthood is there was uh, some, I think, reluctance uh, to kind of take an I guess I would say interventionist. That's probably not the best word to capture it when you're talking about like polling um, language, but um, to get involved in uh, kind of foreign conflicts. However, millennials are um, generally have a more favorable view of foreign countries and specifically international organizations like the United Nations um, and NATO. So I think um, kind of the disinterest in foreign policy is maybe not. Um, I guess I, I, I wouldn't say it's sort of a blanket disinterest. I just think that um, millennials kind of take a different, uh, are, are warmer towards certain aspects of um, foreign policy than they are towards others. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Leila, anything to add or from your side? Yeah, you know, I would add just building off my, my earlier point of um, the ability to hold two truths at the same time is that something that we see among young Democrats and young Republicans is that they think that the government can do more to solve problems. Um, and I think that applies both uh, domestically and, and internationally um, in terms of, of um, supporting kind of what, what uh, this generation sees as kind of a moral imperative um, or an ability to, even if you're not on the kind of moral imperative side, um, support kind of global economic outcomes through, um, as you know, Eleanor kind of mentioned some version of, of intervention. Um, and so I think that while that still remains a priority, um, it is hard to, in, in terms of prioritizing, it is hard to, to kind of fix your, your neighbor's house while your own house is, is on fire. And for many millennials who have gone through now multiple recessions and um, an economic um, crisis, a global pandemic and um, you know major national security um, events like 9-11, I think there are a lot more urgent um, priorities to focus on domestically and, and you know even just using myself as a as a case study as a graduate as you mentioned of the school of foreign service who's now working in domestic politics um i think there is an, an order of operations there that is that is not lost on this generation thank you so much bill a few words finally about topic priorities from your side sure uh, you know uh, I, I i do agree that the the millennial and younger generations uh are concerned about the economy and their own future and the way the country is treating them and the importance of gov the government for helping them. But we also need to keep in mind that not only are these young people racially diverse, but many of them have foreign links, uh, a very high percentage of uh, at least young people who are younger than the voting age population have uh, parents or themselves are foreign born from all parts of the world. They 
a high percentage of them speak a language other than English at home. So they're more receptive, I think, to engaging with people in other backgrounds in other countries. Maybe some of the older generation is, I think, to make arguments that, you know, these are these people in other countries are different from us and they don't, you know, have much connection to us. That kind of message is not going to work as well with this younger generation because they're 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 part of more of a, a global generation than maybe people my age. Thank you so much. My uh, colleague Jan Bösche followed the chat room. Jan, please join us. Um, questions from your side? Uh, yes, indeed. We have some questions online in the chat. And uh, two at least uh, talked about the big question of voter turnout. And you, you mentioned it in your presentations. And uh, one question was uh, about um, uh, expectations in Ohio, for instance, and the big problems we have in this country with COVID, the COVID situation, the debate on um, bailouts in the mail. And the question here is, um, do you expect a higher turnout or do you expect a lower turnout because of all these issues? And another question, perhaps we can, perhaps you can um, deal with both of them at the same time. Uh, you talked about ent enthusiasm of voters and then of turnout and how do they relate? Do we know that enthusiast voters really turn out Or are these two different things? Okay, so who would like to answer? Eleanor, would you have a take on that? So I, I would say I might not be the best person to speak in terms of turnout predictions because um, I do more look at polls as uh, kind of a, a measure of sentiment in the moment. Um, I'm not a forecaster, so that that would not be uh, my particular area of expertise. But I think um, speaking to that, while I think uh, the, the, to some extent there is some perhaps like over reporting when you ask about certainty to vote um, or interest and things like that, that people have a tendency to say yes, that they you know are excited. I think the the high levels of enthusiasm that you are seeing here, um, I, I guess I would, I would be surprised if they don't mean something because um, you don't see changes like that in public opinion um, without it really uh, corresponding with um, some sort of more meaningful change. Uh, that being said, uh, as, as I said, given the current context and the number of variables in play, um, I guess my question for this election in particular would be whether um, enthusiasm is enough to help overcome some of these obstacles um, that you have brought up. Um, that it, you know, it may be more difficult um, or kind of require some additional steps to participate and to vote than it would normally, um, or some more planning. So I think that um, that's kind of what I see is the tension. Um, but I, I, I don't know if one of my other panelists would like to jump in to. William, do you have some 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 findings? I know you mentioned in your um, uh, book or you in in one of your articles you um, try to um, uh, not only concentrate on the impact of um, Corona or COVID 19 but um, the millennial generation is has also been affected, of course, by 2009 by the financial crisis. So this is not the first crisis happening to the millennials. Do we have some findings from from 10 years ago, who would, which would, could answer the question. Yeah, I mean, it is true that uh, the millennials have got, gotten hit in twice. I mean, <laughs> first 10 years ago with the Great Recession that kept them from getting jobs, from buying homes, from delaying marriage, uh, and, uh, you know, still, still many of them still living with their parents. Uh, and then, of course, the Gen Z is now getting hit by the first time for all of this. I think that's a lot of motivation. Uh, for them to sort of feel, uh, you know, they need to have their voices heard. And then, of course, all of the stuff about the, uh, the Black Lives Matter and their, the structural racism, which is also very important for this group. I don't have the data. I mean, I can't really say uh, the data for this group, uh, how they'll deal with it. Because as you mentioned, and as others have mentioned, that, that this is uh, the COVID has really put the brakes on sort of traditional going to the polls Uh, there's going to be have to be a lot of energy put out, not only by the the uh, the people who are manning the polls in these different states, and also how to deal with mail-in ballots, which is as we know from the news, uh, there's some questions about how well that's going to be done. 
uh, and uh, that, but also organizing young people to make sure they can come over these barriers. I think in, in some ways, older people, uh, maybe because they have more time, especially the older people who are retired, you know, can take time to look into these things. The younger people need to be motivated and organized. And uh, there are fortunately a lot of organize, organization groups around the country trying to deal with these issues. But we really don't know because this is kind of an unusual situation. A lot of energy, a lot of motivation, but some barriers. And uh, so I think we'll just have to see how it plays out. Leila, yeah. anything to hear from your side? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I agree. Like, I wish I had a crystal ball and could say how much the enthusiasm would translate into actual turnout. And that's that's kind of the the, the big question, right? Like, will people actually turn out and cast their ballot? Um, you know, I'll say kind of a couple of things from, from my perspective. One, in terms of the structural issues of um, education and making sure that voters are aware of their options, both in terms of absentee voting, early voting, um, and voting in person on, on election day. I think that the, the best thing that we can do now is leverage trusted voices, whether it's at the local level um, or more national voices, which tend to, you know, at least among millennials, have maybe a little bit less credibility um, than more trusted community members um, to just share the information about these are the deadlines, here's how you can vote, whatever you choose to do, these are all legitimate options and make a plan. Um, I think that's that's kind of the, the number one most important thing to, to do. Um, the second is, is kind of legislatively paying attention to on the back end, how are we supporting um, boards of elections to actually you know, process the high volume of uh, mail-in ballots that they'll receive? Are we allowing them to pre-process or do they have to wait until the day of the um, election or polls closing to start counting? Um, and then how are we setting expectations for folks to know that, you know, more, more likely than not, we are not going to have an answer um, on, on November 3rd or on November 4th um, to every question that we have this, this election. And so setting the expectations for a little bit of a tail um, after the election as well, I think is, is important. But I, but I do feel that on the, you know, on the front end, we will, um, we will see a record number. I think, you know, there were primaries held all throughout COVID and we saw long lines at polling stations. We saw a huge, um, demand for vote by mail. And I think that, um, if the primary is any indication, the, the general will be even, even more, more so. And then just one, you know, one kind of personal story. I, um, I volunteered to be a poll worker in my um, in my local at my local polling station here in DC, and uh, at the training they they told us to be prepared to be there until three, four, five a.m. Um, based on experiences of some of the the polling stations um, earlier this year during the primaries that that they are anticipating and what their internal kind of board of election data is showing is that there will be a huge demand to participate in this election. So, you know, that's one polling, one person at one polling place, but I think that that is a trend that we can uh, extrapolate into some, some pretty meaningful data nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, Jan, any further questions from your side from the audience? Yes, I, I could bundle three perhaps and talking about the organization of youth and young voters in the States. Max from Germany, for instance, asks, is there a, a big organization of young voters perhaps uh, comparable with the Junge Union in, in Germany, which is an, an organization close to the conservative CDU party? Um, others ask, for instance, um, uh, is there a chance for candidates to turn these young voters uh, into a reliable base they can work with? And perhaps a third uh, aspect of that, how do these uh, voters change the landscape, the party landscape in the United States? Perhaps not this year, but perhaps in five years or 10 years. Okay, so it's uh, basically all these questions are focusing on the, on the issue of how institutionalized kind of young voters are. Um, who would like to jump in? Leila? I, I can I can start with this one. Um, so so kind of I'll take it in, in the, the three parts that you shared. So kind of the organizations that exist, um, can these voters be a reliable base? And how do we anticipate them changing the, the landscape in the future? So to the first question of the organizations, I think there there are a ton of um, you know partisan youth 
organizations that that exist and are you know very very powerful um uh, in terms of kind of youth um like young democrats on college campuses young republicans on college campuses um even even some issue-based organizations that do a good job of mobilizing young voters based on particular issue interests um I, you know i think something our organization tries to do is to create um intentional spaces where we can create the relationships among young um, young voters and young young legislators to um, turn that that power into real political change, um, and and in many states there are things like youth advisory councils and uh, um, so on and so forth. So um, I think there you know we're 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 building out the the infrastructure to to kind of make sure that we have millennials and and Gen Z at the table when we're making big decisions. Now, I think in terms of a reliable base, he, that is the trick that you cannot use them as an ATM every election session, uh, every election season. And what that means is engaging these young voices thoughtfully in between elections and investing in that infrastructure, not just when you want them to come out and vote for you, but when you really wanna listen to them, hear their preferences and craft policy based on their needs. And so if you are looking to create a reliable base of voters, you have to treat them like people. You have to talk to them. You have to listen to them. Um, you know, it's like going on a, on a first date with somebody. If you're just talking about yourself the whole time, you're probably not going to get a second date. Um, but if you're having a conversation and, and really getting to know the other person, I think that that leads into a more long lasting relationship. Um, and then, and then finally, in, in terms of kind of the, the, um, change over time in the future, as I mentioned, you know, I see a lot of this enthusiasm turning into uh, young people actually running for office and changing, um, you know, what our legislatures look like. And, and Bill, you can probably talk a little bit more about how the demographics, um, the natural demographics trends play into this. But um, I, I do think there will be a significant impact on, on what our politics look like over the next, you know, five years, decade and, and beyond based on um, the trends that we're already seeing. Bill, would you like to add? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I don't have all the numbers, but you know, I do think that when we look at some of the results of some of the primaries in the last year or so, uh, even within the Democratic Party, there's some established older uh, people who held office in the House of Representatives, uh, got challenged by young people with you know, much more progressive ideas. And, uh, you know, there was enough vote out there for those young people to overturn someone who's been in Congress for a long time, both quite liberal, both quite, quite progressive, but not quite the same kind of issues or interest in, in reaching out to some of these progressive, progressive issues. Now, that may also be the case on the Republican side, too, in the case going forward. So I, I think both parties, uh, when they look at the kinds of things they're interested in, and someone mentioned climate change, for example, is an important issue for young people. That's something, you know, you hear Joe Biden mentioning every once in a while now. But, uh, you know, there are young people that feel very strongly about that. And there'll be issues like that will be in the forefront. I think of uh, of future young candidates for the Congress and for other offices around. So from that perspective, the traditional parties uh, are either going to have to open up to this, or you know, there may be third parties uh, it's coming into coming into office to appeal to these people. Eleanor, would you agree? Yes, um, I think you know some of those key issues where you do see generational differences, even among Republicans. I think is something. Um, we have seen in the polls that we have maybe not seen in party platforms um, really reflected yet of trying to recognize the shift um, among people who may be supportive of the party, but um, don't take the same view on some of these issues um, as previous generations did. So I think, um, I guess I, I see more now of Democrats starting to adjust to this and recognize that young voters um, are kind of an important constituency for them and something that they really need to develop. But I think that um, perhaps going forward, there uh, will be some shifts. Um, I sort of hope that there will be. I just hope that there is just a general recognition um, on that on some of these issues that um, millennials voices do matter and that they are going to become um, more important and more of a force and something that um, that those views need to be not just a one-sided thing um, within uh, parties reaching out to the generation. 
Yeah, we do have um, a few more minutes. Let me allow a, um, a question or allow me a question from my side because how, how, how much can we actually generalize these topic priorities or these issues given that, let's say, on the one hand, about um, one in 10 people eligible to vote this year are naturalized citizens. Most of them, as we've learned, uh, Hispanic or Asian. Um, yet more than 60% of these eligible voters live in just five states of the US, in California, New York, Florida, Texas, and New Jersey. What does that mean, let's say, when it comes to trying to generalize these uh, topic priorities, the issues both uh, uh, on the side of millennials as well as on the side of minorities. Perhaps uh, again, because uh, you've had these uh, 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 very interesting maps already, Bill, uh, perhaps we start with you. Well, it's true that, uh, you know, there are different issues that are going to be important uh, to Democrats in California than maybe uh, in some parts of the Midwest, especially as, as it deals with deals with immigration and uh, racial justice and, and these sorts of things, just because of the, the, the demographic makeup of the people that would normally vote Democratic in each of those different states. You know, I think that's really the, the, the uh, challenge of a presidential candidate, uh, someone like Joe Biden, who has to know, uh, this is getting into the weeds here in the US politics, but we have this thing called the Electoral College. He has to, he has to win states like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin which are very different states than say Arizona or Florida or Georgia or North Carolina. And in those states, the democratic folks, more than racial, the, the latter states, more than racial minorities, probably younger, uh, he's gonna have to deal with their issues but not turn around uh, the support he could get in those other states. It's an interesting, uh, it's an in interesting conundrum. And you know, it does, uh, it does show how to be a successful candidate. You have to try to appeal to all of these groups as the demography is changing in different ways in different places. Uh, we'll find out how well he does, I guess. Thank you so much. We have three more minutes. Jan, a final question from your side or from the audience? Um, actually, um, perhaps we talked, there was one question about the topic you just uh, debated, the question that how um, black voters, for instance, how they are polled, do we know how they were going to turn out this year? and Hispanics. And in the last days, we had some media reports on Biden's attempts to reach out to Hispanics. Uh, how does that work for him and how important is it for him? Who would like to answer? Yeah, I can jump in on that. I mean, I think you can count on the black vote being strongly democratic. Uh, the question is the turnout. And I think a lot of people felt that one of the reasons that uh, Trump beat Hillary Clinton in 2016 is she didn't get quite the turnout that she needed in some states, uh, even though typically when you look at the results that I showed, the blacks vote very strongly Democratic anyway. This time around, uh, as, as you point out, the, the Latino or Hispanic vote is going to be key for the Democrats, especially in a state like Florida or in a state like Arizona. Uh, which they might want to try to take. And uh, in the primaries anyway, Biden did not do as well with Hispanics as he did with blacks. And uh, so I think, and even some of the recent polling shows, and I guess in Florida that uh, he's not doing so well with Hispanics, that means he's got to up his game, uh, I think in those states. Uh, they're typically, except for some segments of the Hispanic population, and you think about Hispanics, so lots of, these are people who come from different countries, from Cuba or from different parts of Latin America or Mexico and so forth. They all don't vote exactly the same. They don't all have the same issues, but they do tend to, for the most part, vote democratic. But to energize them on their issues, I think, is going to be kind of a challenge for Biden this time because he's going to need some states that has a fair Hispanic population. Thank you, Bill. Um, uh, I'm, I'm also happy that you at least briefly touched upon the issue of swing states because that was one question from the audience was also related or, um, uh, about the swing states. Unfortunately, we are running out of time already. Uh, we could continue, of course, uh, um, much longer, but we are running out of time. Thank you so much to our transatlantic audience for your time and attention. Yet, I would like to express my sincere gratitude, especially, of course, to our panelists, Leila Saidan, 
Eleanor O'Neill and Will William Frey. Thank you for your time, for your invaluable contributions and your thoughts. As I said before, I think we have learned a lot and I'm sure that also, that also counts for our participants. Next week, we will try to explain at least some aspects of the electoral system in the US, for example, the Electoral College, which was mentioned already to our transatlantic audience. Please feel free to join us online. For now, thank you for your attention. Goodbye from Washington, DC. Thank you.